everything works. You can, you can hear me. Good. Uh, yeah. So, as as as, it, as you said, yes, we will now switch back from that point of end of the wire to the local end of the wire where I actually plug my computer in, and I'm going to talk about local networks, networks like Wi-Fi network in this building and similar, uh, because uh, this is the place where sometimes we deploy IPv6, but uh, uh, sometimes we uh, still depend on v4. Uh, let me just uh, illustrate it. Uh, we used to say in our trainings that uh, the best transition uh, mechanism is dual stack, where you basically have IPv6 deployed next to IPv4, so you have both. That means, that means uh, IPv6 is preferred because that's the default setting of operating systems. So if there is IPv6 already, it's, it's, it's just uh, it, IPv6 is used. If not, completely different path is taken and IPv4 is used. It's very nice and works very well with one, uh, one small issue, and that is that uh, it does not address the IPv4 scarcity at all, because you still need IPv4 everywhere. And so th 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 it's nice, but in the long term, this is not the solution that would save us or save us from deploying scary grid NAT and things like that. Uh, there's another thing. Uh, out of the lots of transition mechanisms, the other one that stands aside is called NET64, and we talked about this a lot today already, because it allows you to basically run uh, IPv6-only networks that are usable even by normal people, because uh, the IPv6 uh, also contains somehow IPv4 in it by translating part of the address space into the IPv4 internet. So virtually for your, uh, from your endpoint perspective from that laptop that is down there, everything seems to be accessible only with IPv6, either directly or via this uh, translator. Uh, there's this trick called DNS64, which makes uh, DNS work. So it usually works with some issues that are here on this slide. So if you put IPv4 literal, for instance, of course it cannot work because you don't have IPv4 on the, on the machines. Uh, but then again, this concept is very well working and it's uh, getting better and better. Uh, so for instance, basically all mobile devices that are there on the market are ready. Uh, either it's Apple that is, force, that is forcing the uh, software vendors to, uh, to uh, use, uh, uh, to support basically NAT64 networks since 2016 already. Uh, Apple is also like doing this thing. They have developed their own protocol called Happy Eyeballs 2.0, which uh, is uh, dealing with issue where IPv6 might not be working and IPv4 is working. Uh, so switching, uh, switching from one protocol to another, also in other corner cases. And finally, even though obviously people from Apple didn't like it, but they, under the pressure of, uh, let's say, feature parity, they even implemented something called CLET, which is the translator that basically, uh, basically the, that's counter translation of NAT64. Uh, so you can tether your uh, iPhone to your computer and you get dual stack on your computer, even though the upstream, the back hole, the network is just V6 only. Uh, with Android, they got much a simpler approach. They just say, okay, let's just put CLAT in there. So we will translate every V4 into V6 in the phone for every single application. So we don't have to care about all applications supporting v V6 and all those things that Apple does. Uh, in the end, the effect is sort of the same. Basically, every single current mobile device can work reliably without any customer issues on IPv6 own network. Uh, the problem is, Desktops are different story. Uh, it is changing a little bit, but it, uh, we are still not that far as, as uh, mobiles. The reason for that is that mobiles are mostly under the influence of mobile carriers, and mobile carriers are mostly deploying Net64, and they are forcing vendors to support it on their side because like, that's how the business works. Uh, with desktops, uh, first of all, the Happy Eyeballs 2.0 is not available. Uh, I can see there are some questions already, but please uh, keep them at, uh, for the end. 
uh, yeah, uh, Happy Eyeballs is not available outside Apple. Uh, the 2.0, there is just the default Happy Eyeballs algorithm, which doesn't support V6 only at all. And even on Apple, it's only available for some applications like Safari, but not other applications like Firefox. Uh, the situation is getting better because uh, recently, for instance, Chrome added this feature called use NAT64 translation for IPE4 literals. So now if you use Chrome and put their IPE4 literal in the address bar, even if you are on IPv6 own network, it will work somehow. Uh, but there's no CLUT in most desktop platforms like Windows, Linux, Chrome OS. And there are, there are those small problems just I uh, mentioned before. So there are legacy applications that just open because they were programmed in 1990s and nobody changed them ever since. So they just use IP for only sockets and they will never work with V6. And uh, or there are this problem with corporate VPNs. Corporate VPNs are very interesting things because they are usually causing the most problems. Uh, so the question here is, can we, as a network operators of this access network, can we run IPv6 only, at least for all those mobile devices that are, that are there and that, the, that support already this operation? And one of the way how to do, make this work is to extend the old IPv4 protocol called DHCP that everybody is using for provisioning IPv4 addressing on, on, their, on their computers uh, to indicate that the network supports uh, IPv6 only operation and the device supports it. So in this case, first case here, is the device is actually announcing by requesting parameter number 108 uh, uh, that it supports IPv6 only operation. Uh, and DHCP server ignores it because this is an old network, so it does not offer any, any option with number 108. So the DHCP transaction continues with request and acknowledge, and the uh, device is running IPv4. Uh, so here you see that, that the, the client is willing to run IPv6 only, but the server just ignores it. Uh, the other scenario is that the network is ready for IPv6 only operation. So the device is again requesting a 108 uh, option, and the DHCP server knows that the network the device is connected to supports IPv6 only operation. So it offers, in its offer, a 108 option with, uh, with a parameter value that is 30 minutes. And this basically means uh, you can work IPv6 only and uh, you should turn off your IPv4 stack for 30 minutes. So the device goes silent, the transaction never finish, so as you, as you saw, the DHCP have four messages, there are only two messages, and then the transaction will stop. So the address is not allocated, actually, or not assigned to the device. And instead, instead of uh, the device is working V6 only. So this way, we can have one network that supports both IPv6 only operation for most modern devices, like mobile devices, and at the same time, the legacy devices that require V4 because they have these old ap applications and all of this, will still work and will still get IPE4 like normally. Uh, now, I was wondering uh, whether this is somehow deployed. So I made some measurements and it turned out that the option 108 is quite uh, well deployed. As I said, every single modern mobile device supports it, be it Android, be it iOS, but also MacOS. That's interesting. So even the desktop platform uh, from Apple supports it. So when I run a measurement during last right meeting, uh, there was actually 74% of devices connected to network uh, that were advertising using DHCP that they support IPv6 only operation. So devices are already ready. Uh, networks are lacking behind. With this list, there is one interesting case because the mobiles, as we said, they always support either this um, mitigation in applications like in Apple or CLAT like in Android. But with Mac OS, this is still like a free platform where you can run, 
run whatever software you have, even some legacy software that supports IPv4 only, which would break. Um, so it turned out that uh, even macOS supports CLAT. Uh, it was introduced in macOS 12, uh, and in macOS 12, it was triggered by some special combination that there has, had to be DHCP option 108 and it had, there had to be a special root advertisement option called PREF64. I will just uh, talk about it in a moment. Uh, since macOS 13, which is the current version, uh, the CLAT is activated without any special requirements. As soon as there is uh, NAT64 and DNS64 in the network, it will automatically enable uh, CLAT, so even like legacy applications with IPv4 only sockets are uh, working. Uh, at the same time, with introduction of macOS uh, 13, uh, they stopped supporting pure IPv6 only networks. That's really surprising, but now it seems that if you connect um, an Apple device to a network that only supports v6 and there is no NAT64, DNS64, it will just disconnect and uh, tell the user that the network doesn't work properly. Uh, so what kind of, uh, I was talking about this PREF64 option. What is it for? It's another, it's a new option for router advertisements and basically by using this option, the router is announcing to the devices in the network what is the NAT64 prefix, which is an information that the device needs in order to activate the CLAT because the CLAT translates the IPv4 uh, packets that are originating in the device into IPv6 packets just to transport them to IPv6 to the NAT64 where they are translated back to v4. So it has to, it, it needs to know what prefix is used for NAT64 because it can be different in different networks. Uh, yeah, so this is sort of a new option that is very well supported on client devices like Android, iOS, macOS, uh, but not very well supported by network vendors. Uh, so let's, uh, let's go to that part of the story. If you would like to run such a network, uh, first of all, you need this DHCP v4, DHCP, the old DHCP protocol with the new option 108. Uh, and this turned out to be very easy because most DHCP servers out there already support defining custom options and it turned out that there is no requirement for any special processing on side of DHCP servers. So even if you use your very old DHCP server, as, as soon as you can define custom option number 108 and put there four bytes of the timeout, uh, that's, that's a valid, uh, valid option 108, so you can use DNS mask, for instance, like this example. Uh, yeah, the only, the only caveat here is that in order to work, uh, it, for it to work, the DHCP pool of addresses have to be non-empty, because as soon as the DHCP pool is empty, is depleted, the DHCP server will not respond, so it will not respond with the of option 108. So this is the only requirement for custom processing that is, that is uh, laid down in the RFC, but it's really not necessary for general operation. Uh, PREF64 option is much harder because that means that every single router that is emitting router advertisements have to start emitting a new router advertisement option. And unfortunately, uh, yeah, there is no such thing as uh, custom RA options, so this usually requires uh, upgrade of the firmware of your router. So uh, I don't see that uh, this is going forward uh, very fast unless we really start asking our vendors. Uh, on the other hand, as I said, this was a hard requirement in iOS 12. iOS 13 does not require Brave 64 anymore. So it's still a good idea to try to deploy it, but if there are some issues that you cannot do it, uh, it should work even without it now. Uh, you can see a list of, of, uh, of uh, adoption of this option in software routers. Uh, most of them are unreleased, so you have to go to the bleeding edge uh, version of the software. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, shortening it out because uh, yeah, we are, we are a little bit over time. So 
uh, this was basically the concept, and uh, I would like to now just uh, show up where this could be helpful, where this is not helpful. So the main pro here is that you have just one network that supports everything, and you don't waste IPv4 addresses for devices that don't need it because they are made in a way that uh, they work with v6 only. At the same time, you don't you are not losing functionality for uh, devices or applications that requires IPv4. Uh, yeah, the the way how you, how you set up makes that uh, it actually that even even the devices that are using v4 will still use only minimum of v4 because they will prefer DNS 64 and NAT 64 and go to NAT 64. Uh, what is the cons of, of such network setup? First of all, it's the most complex setup because you have everything from dual stack and you have everything from IPv6 and all of these have to be, uh, all of these requirements have to be uh, there together. Uh, also, it's not a magic bar that will save you from deploying v4. In order to support those legacy devices, you still have to have v4 deployed everywhere. And you still have to have deployed uh, NAT64, which is just uh, another name for carrier gate NAT. So if you are scared of carrier gate NATs, you cannot avoid it, uh, because that's how, that's how the IPv6 only networks uh, have to work. Yeah, and there are some interoperability issues. So uh, I would like to say, if you what are the cases when you would like to consider this kind of setup? It's mostly if, for instance, you don't use NAT in your network and your DHCP pool is filling up because the number of devices that people are bringing to your network is going up all the time. But good news is that most of the devices people are bringing to your network uh, are now supporting v 6 own operation. So you, can, uh, so you will not uh, waste your pool on them. Uh, also, if you are running out of private space, you are running already NAT, but you have not enough private addresses, even this can be the case, this is another, uh, this is another uh, um, time when you can consider this setup. Uh, it's very helpful, especially if there are mobile device or Apple device in your network. If there are only Windows uh, computers, uh, it will not be helpful that much. Um, and also, the nice thing is uh, when, to, when to try it out is that you already have NAT64, maybe you have separate SSID and separate network with NAT64 and people are not using it because why would they if they have also another option which is probably better for them. So this is how you can, you can sort of uh, shift to the place where you can gradually think of undeploying IPv4. Yeah, I skipped through a lot. So this is my last slide. I would just like to say before I, uh, before I end that if you want to enjoy this setup in real life, please come to RIPE 68 that would uh, take place in May in a one month in Rotterdam. And the main meeting network will be IPv6 mostly. That's everything from me. Thank you very much, Andre. I think it's time to put uh, pressure on some Windows. <clears throat> is it though? <laughs> so there is a CLAT in Windows 10? Uh, yes, there is, but it only gets activated when you plug in USB 4G or 5G modem. Not, yes. if, not if you have Ethernet. But it's not true that there is no CLAT. <laughs> Um, what we need to put pressure on them for is, is things like DHCP option 108 to make sure that they enable it on Wi-Fi. Um, there's also, I should note as well, for Linux, there's a CLAT-D implementation that can hook into Network Manager or System D or whatever you need. All that requires, really, is someone with a big enough canonical Linux or canonical Ubuntu deployment to turn around to them and say, hey, can you implement this, please? And they'll probably go off and do it. And the same is true for Microsoft Windows, really. Um, the one thing I would note is, though, in, in, in a lot of cases where this does make sense, the CLAT on the endpoint device isn't necessarily the right answer. I mean, we, we use a lot of this in mobile, right? We do tons of this stuff. But when we were talking about kind of the potential for using CLATs in broadband, for example, it, we never really thought about actually having those on the endpoint device. We always thought about having them on some form of customer equipment, like CPE, 
Um, and I think if you were going to conceptualize that into an enterprise network, potentially, you know, the local Wi-Fi controller in the, on the floor or on, in the building or where, however, that, however you separate that out, if that's capable of doing a layer three function and you're know, maintaining that clap there, you, you will obviously have quite a large IPv4 legacy network with your Wi-Fi clients potentially, but you could still uh, separate that out per floor, per, per building. Yes, exactly, exactly as you said. Uh, the thing is, uh, this is sort of like, uh, well, it's sort of meta, but it's like very transition mechanism, transitioning first from IPv4 to dual stack, and then usually people end there and said we have IPv6 work done, but there's still this IPv4 legacy that is, that is there and that is causing issues. So possibly the next step is once you have the dual stack, the next logical step is switch to IPv6 mostly and, uh, and uh, keep the dual stack as it is and, uh, and uh, slowly start undeploying v4 from the part of the network because if you want to have IPv4 at the end, you have to have all the way IPv4 through. But then maybe another step, and this is how I see it, is to actually build a part of your core network with v6 only and exactly as you said, do the translation for the for this residual devices because there will still be probably some devices that will not support V6 only operation in years. Mm -hmm. So you can do the same thing that you expect from the device to do it on, on its own, the CLAT. You can do it on very close to the to the edge of the network, like in the controller or in the access point, wherever. So most of your backbone or most of your enterprise network will still stay V6 only, and you will do the, the, the required seal transition will either happen on the end device or in the closest place to the, to the, to the end device. Yeah. And thank you for giving me another good way to justify going to RIPE 86. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. There is Graham. Thank you. Um, Tom's already stole my thunder on the CLAT-D on Linux implementation. Um, but just on your VPN standpoint over CLAT-D, that is something that I've run into personally. When EE started ruling out um, 464 XLAT, the university's VPN just would not work over it. Um, and I think that VPNs are going to be the big blocker to the IPv6 only stuff because they really are not reliable over 464 XLAT. And if you try and do something like CLAT D on a Linux machine and then VPN over that, half the time you find out that the, uh, the VPN kills the CLAT D when it connects. So you end up with the VPN connecting, killing your CLAT D, killing the VPN. So there are still challenges here. And I think it does just come down to this is just transition. And we do need to be pushing the IPv6 support. And I don't think, Tom, I'm afraid that shoving the CLAT onto the edge of the wireless is the best idea because then you are still keeping a massive legacy asset there when if a device needs it they can do it themselves <laughs> yeah we wish we could debate that we wish devices were able to uh, do these things uh, themselves maybe maybe also the thing is maybe you can just do a management decision that even not all features are supported by all devices. Maybe it's, it's a reason for you to, let's say, replace all your fleet with uh, MacBooks instead of Windows machines, or I don't know. <laughs> like, like, there are many solutions to this problem. <laughs> well, there are, there, yeah, there are, there are, there are, these are good ways. These are good arguments with the vendors. And I remember that's how we actually got the uh, something on Windows, was it uh, RDNSS? Yeah, there RDNSS. was thanks to Comcast, John Brzozowski, there was a threat of uh, lost revenue and that somehow worked. However, we can see there's a, like the whole ecosystem, you said like the hardware routers don't support it today, you know, and they are often used on layer three switches, they are like the default gateway which are sending the RAs, right? So we need uh, the, that capability there as well. So. But we are eating into our uh, tea and coffee break. Thank you very much, Andre. I, I believe this would be interesting because, it's, again, it's a controversial topic. People have not really heard about this as much. And it's a food for thoughts, maybe something you want to try on your IPv6 journey. So thank you, and we will come back in 30 minutes. <laughs>